Hello and welcome to the final installment of Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, where we are reading the Victorian novel together. I'm Dr. Christian Lehman, and in this episode, we will finish the novel talking about chapters 54 to 59. The material in this chapter includes the flight down the Thames, Van Wemmick's wedding. We have then the court case and the death of Megwitch. Pip gets sick and Joe caretakes. We return to the village to discover that Joe and Biddy are married. And then in chapter 59, with Stella one last time. But let's start with this exciting journey down the river out to the Thames estuary. And before writing this chapter, this is what Dickens did, recorded by John Foster in his life. And this is quoted in the companion by Thoreau. To make himself sure of the actual course of a boat in such circumstances, and what possible incidents the adventure might have, Dickens hired a steamer for the day from Blackwall to Southwark. Eight or nine friends and three or four fam members of the family were on board, and he seemed to have no care the whole of that summer day, the 22nd of May, 1861, except to enjoy their enjoyment and entertain them with his own in shape of a thousand whims and fancies. But his sleepless observation was at work all the time and nothing had escaped his keen vision on either side of the river. The 15th chapter of the third of volume is a masterpiece. So let's look at some of this progression that um, Dickens made, but then also that he has Pip make afterward. So we start here at kind of the mill pond is where we're going to pick up language. They're going to make their way back and forth. Another location mentioned is Aerith, which is right here, down to Gravesend, and then out to the Thames estuary. Let's look in greater detail. The house with the bow windows, said Wemmick, being by the overside, down the pool, there between the limehouse and Greenwich, and being kept, it seems, by a very respectable widow. So we learn that it's on the riverside between limehouse and Greenwich. This is where, um, Clara's house is, where Megwitch is staying. So here's Limehouse, here's Greenwich. There's somewhere inside of this space. Um, to situate us, right, there's the Tower of London over here, uh, the center. Here is another map of this, kind of showing how densely populated it is. Again, the Limehouse and Greenwich. And here's some passages from chapter 46. The boat was brought round to the temple stairs. So here's the temple, and we can guess here roughly is where the stairs are. That's where Pip is keeping them. And then he says, at first I kept above the Blackfriars Bridge, but as the hours of the tide changed, I took towards London Bridge. It was old London Bridge. So Pip here is describing his kind of patterning of riding his, uh, his boat at the beginning of his rowing. Right. So he starts here, and then eventually he extends, getting used to being seen on the river and building his strength. Chapter 46 as well. I knew well enough how to shoot the bridge after seeing it done, and so began to row among the shipping in the pool and down to Eris. So here, right, we learned he can now get down to Tower Bridge, and this is this area. What shooting the pool, or shooting the bridge means, as he enters into this space, and you'll notice here's where the docks are. So that's why it means there's all this shipping that's taking place right there, because all these boats are there that he has to maneuver around. Here, all the way over here, is where um, Aerith is. And here again, there's the Limehouse and the Mill. So you have to go all of this space. We should then be, and this now in chapter 54, we should then be well in those long reaches below Gravesend between Kent and Essex, where the river is broad and solitary, where the waterside inhabitants are very few, and where low and public houses are scattered here and there, of which we can choose one for a resting place. So Essex is all the space up here, Kent is all the space down here, and there's Gravesend. And this kind of idea, right, very specific about the inhabitants being few, the, the few public houses, that seems to come directly from Dickens having made this journey. He then writes, I looked out the window. It commanded the causeway where we had hauled up our boat. And as my eyes adapted themselves 
to the light of the clouded moon, I saw two men looking at her. They passed by under the window, looking at nothing else, and they did not go down to the landing place, which I could discern to be empty, but struck across the marsh in the direction of the Nor. So the Nor is this space right at the entrance of that estuary. Right? So I'm including this quote because it labels this, these specific locations of what they're attempting to do with this journey, going from Gravesend out the estuary into the Nor. So we learned there's a lot of, um, of boats, right? The shipping, et cetera. And it's also dangerous here at the estuary. So here's a Turner uh, image. Uh, it's just a, a draft of a final painting. But here we see a cutter, some fishing boats, and a guard ship in the town. And we can see quite the, um, the volume of the waves, right? It's a, it's a dangerous area because uh, the different waters are all meeting right there with the town flowing. Um, so a couple of things that are fun here. We have a detail in chapter 54. The steamer for Hamburg and the steamer for Rotterdam would start from London at about nine on Thursday. So we might wonder, well, why are all these ships from the Netherlands there, all these Dutch boats? And Parisian supplies us with this charming anecdote. The presence of Dutch boats out of Billingsgate was a common sight on account of Holland's monopoly of the eel trade. Popular lore claims that the Dutch were granted this privilege because they were willing to continue shipments of eels to London during the height of the bubonic plague in 1665. So here are some jellied eels for your delectation. It's a food that does not occur very often in Dickens, but we nicely explain why we have the Rotterdam boat. We have some excellent images of um, the rise of industrialization that Dickens crafts for us here. At that time, the steam traffic on the Thames was far below its present extent, and watermen's boats were far more numerous. Of barges, sailing colliers, and coasting traders, there were perhaps as many as now. But of steamships, great and small, not a tithe or a twentieth part, so many. So we're interested in this kind of idea of the steamship. Early on, at the time of his writing, it's not common. Later on, it is going to be very common. But it happens to be a steamship that will disrupt their plans. So here is a nice example, um, roughly from the 1840s, of what the Thames could have looked like here. So here we see our, our sailing ships, and then here, a classic just steamer, not an ocean-going steamer at all. Um, those would tend to have rails, but I want you to notice here's the pat sails. They would have sails, not rails. Here's the paddle right there. Um, but if we go back, no, no, never mind. We have this little image, early conversation that Pip has once they pick up Magwitch. If you know the dear boy, he said to me, what it is to sit here alone with my dear boy and have my smoke after having been day by day betwixt four walls, you'd envy me. But you don't know what it is. Oh, I think I know the delights of freedom, I answered. Ah, he said shaking his head gravely. But you don't know it equal to me. You must have been under lock and key, dear boy, to know it equal to me. Uh, but I ain't a going to be lonely. It occurred to me as inconsistent that for a mastering idea, he should have endangered his freedom and even his life. So here we see one of like, these last vestiges of Pitt's extreme ignorance, right? Where he thinks as a free person who really maybe has had some small sufferings, like I'm not gonna deny the fact that he had a rough childhood, but nowhere in comparison to what other people have suffered, and particularly Magwitch. So Pip says he knows the delights of freedom, never having been confined. Magwitch, on the other hand, who has not only been in, confined in London jails, in barges um, off of the Kent coast, but also sent to Australia as a convict. He has been extremely confined, and then also he's been having to stay hidden in this house. And so that's what he responds to, gently, I think. And then Pip comes back with this thought where it says a mastering idea. So he uses the language of master and control, which is precisely what Magwitch has been fighting against by fleeing, being a convict worker back in Australia. A fun little joke. Here we have the lower class people talking and Dickens always delights in capturing their idiom. And he allows himself a sort of pun on one of the words. A four-oared galley, did you say? Said I. A four, said the jack, and two sitters. 
Do they come ashore here? They put in with two stone, two gallon jars for some beer. I'd have been glad to piss in the beer myself, to the Jeff. I'll put some rattling physic in it. So to poison the beer, right, is what that is, but also to piss on the beer, right, to urinate in it. So it's this wonderful moment where there's a, a slight ambiguity that allows us a moment of playfulness of a substance that is only rarely, if ever, mentioned in Dickens. This brings us, though, to the climax. At the same moment, so Pip is in the boat, they're, they're, they're fleeing, they see another boat coming towards them, it rushes out. At the same moment, without giving any audible direction to his crew, he ran the galley abroad of us. They had pulled in one sudden stroke ahead, had got their oars in, had run a floor to us, and were holding on to our gunwale before we knew what they were doing. This caused great confusion on board the steamer, and I heard them calling to us, and heard the order given to stop the paddles. And I heard them stop, but felt her driving down upon us irresistibly. So here you kind of need to understand the construction of the 19th century steamship, which did not have a rear paddle, as you might be envisioning, but instead had two side paddles. So here from the Scottish um, Museum, we see those paddles. We also know this is an ocean going one because it has sails as well. That would be um, beneficial. So Pip is kind of up along the side, getting driven against it, and the paddle is going right there. After the capture we um, and the death of Thompson, we have a comic interlude where Wemmick gets married. And this is just a fine little bit. I thought this odd, however, I said nothing, and we set off. We went towards Camberwell Green, and when we were thereabouts, Wemmick said suddenly, ah, oh, hello, here's a church. There was nothing very surprising in that, but again, I was rather surprised when he said, as if he were animated by a brilliant idea, let's go in. We went in, Wemmick leaving his fishing rod in the porch and looked all around. In the meantime, Wemmick was diving into his coat pockets and getting something out of paper there. Hello, he said. Here's a couple pair of gloves, let's put them on. As the gloves are white kid gloves, and as the post office was widened to its utmost extent, I now began to have my strong suspicions. They were strengthened into certainty when I beheld the agent enter his side door, escorting a lady. Hello, said woman, here's Miss Skiffins. Let's have a wedding. So we're building towards the conclusion and the classic way of ending a 19th century novel, particularly a Dickens novel, is with wedding. And so here we have Wemmick's wedding set up. We're kind of building towards a series of climaxes. We have a series of weddings. And so we start with the minor characters. It has a little bit of an unusual conclusion though. They go out to eat. It was pleasant to observe that Mrs. Wemmick no longer unwound Wemmick's arm when it adapted itself to her figure, but sat in a high backed chair against the wall like a violoncello in its case and submitted to be embraced as that melodious instrument might have done. So early on, there was all of this great energy around Miss Skiffins trying to control women's desires. We would try to put an arm around her, really kind of in place. Here, though, she's become Mrs. Wemmick. She's now submitting. She's being compared to an uh, instrument and um, being played by the male. And so it seems like there's kind of this element. It's meant to be playful. But the message that comes across is she has lost all of that agency that she used to have before with this submission to the male. So it was kind of last instance of the patriarchy. Um, so here we have a bit where Pip is visiting um, Magwitch in jail. And all I want to point out is back on page four, he was just called man. The man, the man, the man, the man, the man. And now, though, we have Pip with his increased respect for him saying he and giving him his, his pronoun. So there's a really a series of interesting things that happen with pronouns in these last few chapters that I'm going to try to trace a little bit. One thing that comes up, though, is Pip's jewelry account. So this has been going on um, all the way from the back. So we learn when he's being sick, what's the debt? 123 pounds, 15, six, jeweler's account, I think. Going backward. Being on one occasion at breakfast time, threatened by letter with legal proceedings, not wholly unconnected, as my local paper might put it with jewelry. So 200 pages earlier, we'd seen that there were some problems happening. A little bit later. This is Magwitch when he comes and he looks at Pip. Looky here, he went on, taking my watch out of my pocket and turning it towards him, a ring on his finger. Well, I recoiled from his touch as if he'd been a snake, a gold one, and a beauty. That's a gentleman's, I hope. A diamond all set round with rubies. That's a gentleman's, I hope. So there we see this problem. 
that jewelry is being associated with being a gentleman, right? So the external trappings are being associated, even though they're driven pit into dire debt. But Meg, which admires it, associating that external manifestation for the act of being a gentleman. But where does it go back to? It all stems with the first sighting of Miss Havisham. Some bright jewels sparkled on her neck and on her hands, and some other jewels lay sparkling on the table. And then you'll remember there's other instances where Estella compares herself essentially to the jewels. Like she's like, I and the jewels are one and the same. So it's a really interesting uh, undercurrent of this idea of the jewelry manifesting Pip's early desire, culminating with this debt that then Joe will pay off. But first, he's in his sickness. Then I had a fever, that I was a steel beam of a vast engine clashing and whirling over a gulf, and yet that I implored in my own person to have the engine stopped and my part in it hammered off that I passed through these phases of disease. So this was an early, or, or it's, it's a simile that is comparing himself or a metaphor to a machine, right? To an element of the industrial age, ages. And the industrial age is going to wind on irrevocably. It can't be called back. But he wants something to, right? There's this sense of stop time moving. I want to maybe go back in time. And he makes this comparison. He says, I wish that my part in it had been hammered off. This is another image of castration, right? His desire, that is the desire to be a gentleman, maybe the desire for Estella, has led him into this terrible place. This desire to live in the city, to live in a world of industrialization is what has caused this. He's, and even the fact that like the ship got destroyed, he was trying to flee on by another element of the industrial age. That's what's culminating in this disease in his body. And remember, we also had an earlier image, but it was an image of control. So this was the simile about Joe. I have often thought of him since, like the steam hammer that can crush a man or pattern eggshell. It's a great combination of strength and gentleness. So here, even though Joe is a man of the country, he's getting the simile comparison. It's done in a way that is complete control, whereas Pip is just a part and out of control. In this last moment of realizing what it is that Joe has done for him, he finally uses his name over and over and over again in Zoe to kind of start apologizing. He's left Joe out of his book by and large. Now he's pulling Joe in really intently towards the end, even asking to be struck, which of course he will never do. And this realization culminates in a line that is kind of horny, but it fits with the 19th century maudlin, uh, I think it's quite effective at this point, 463 pages in the book. I lay there penitently whispering, oh God bless him, oh God bless this gentle Christian man. And now we learn, right, it's not jewels that make you a gentleman, it is being a person like Joe. Something that I am confused about, but been working on and thinking about, is this oddity around two spluttering pens that appear in the end of the novel. In chapter 51, when they're bullying Mike, Wemmick says this. You did, said Wemmick. How dare you? You're not in a fit state to come here. You can't come here without spluttering like a bad pen. What do you mean by it? And then, this was an exchange Pippet overheard, he talks about Joe learning to write. When he did begin, he made every downstroke so slowly that it might have been six feet long. But every upstroke, I could hear his pen spluttering extensively. So I think there's more to be said here. My current idea is that there's a little bit of animosity still in Pip, where he sees himself as this superior, right? He knows how to write well. He knows how to do these things elegantly. He is no spluttering pen. Whereas class-wise, Joe and Mike are put on the same level. So this might be some of Pip's insecurities that he's trying to put forth onto Joe um, and alleviate himself of those guilts in the same way that Wemmick and Jaggers had used the character of Mike earlier to restore their status quo. <clears throat> Jumping ahead, we learn that Orlick attacked Pumblechook. And here, I think we have a hint of some male sexual assault. That's it, Pip, said Joe. And they took his till, and they took his gas box, and they drank his wine, and they partook of his whittles. And they slapped his face, and they pulled his nose, and they tied him up in his bed, and they gave him a dozen. And they stuffed his mouth full of flowering annuals to rewind his crying out. But he knowed Orlick, and Orlick's in the county jail. So 
This is actually a, a scene that imitates an earlier one from Barnaby Rudge. Um, but this is rather different in the very specific element. Um, well, actually, now that I think about it, there's also a maypole that goes through a window there, so there's phallic imagery um, over in that one. But back to this passage. The specific mention of tying him up to the bedpost suggests that there is something that happens in the privacy room. They stub his mouth, right, so an oral cavity, with flowers to prevent his crying out. But specifically learn that they are flying, flowering annuals. Annual, beginning A-N-N-U, and ending in S, contains with it the form of the word anus. And so I think what we have under the subtext here is this description, maybe meant to be comic, of like Orlick enacting a revenge that people wanted to enact on Humblechip, but actually one that implies male sexual assault on the part of Orlick against Pip, or against um, Humblechip, one that perhaps is building out of all of that sexual phallic imagery that we looked at with Bentley and Pitt earlier. One issue that um, is raised every once in a while about Joe is why doesn't he prevent himself or prevent Mrs. Joe from beating the child Pitt? And here he explains it. So I have a lot of text here. I'm only going to read the part that's in bold. If I put myself in opposition to her, but that she dropped into you always the heavier so we learn in this line that Joe had tried to stop it, and it meant that Mrs. Joe beat Pip even harder. Whether this excuses Joe, I'll leave it up to kind of you and your ethics and morality to wrestle out, but there is an awareness in the novel that it's happening. And Joe does try to account for it himself, even asking for forgiveness at the end in a parallel or an inverse to how Joe Pip is also asking. But Pip has one more final delusion. Um, he decides he's going to go down to Biddy and he's going to ask her, if you can like me only half as well once more, if you can take me with all my faults and disappointments in my head, if you can receive me like a forgiven child, and indeed I am so sorry, Biddy, I have as much need of a hushing voice and a soothing hand. I hope I'm a little worthier for, of you than I was. Not much, but a little. So he essentially wants Biddy to marry him, right? Think about that going backward in time, breaking off the steam engine part that I was talking about earlier. Nope, turns out that's not the final delusion because he arrives in the village, Biddy and Joe have been married. This is now the second marriage. So we're building up, right? And good things come in threes. And he says, they had taken me into the kitchen and I had laid my dear, my head down on the old deal table. Biddy held one of my hands to her lips and Joe's restoring touch was on my shoulder. Which you aren't strong enough, my dear, for to be surprised, said Joe. And Biddy said, I ought to have thought of it, dear Joe, but I was too happy. They were both so overjoyed to see me, so proud to see me, so touched by my coming to them, so delighted that I should have come by accident to make their day complete. No, the reason Biddy is so happy is because she and Joe have been married. But here, Pip has to make it all about himself one last time. This brings us to the end, the very famous end or endings of the novel. Here, I'm indebted to this man in the corner, Jeremy Parrott, for his excellent video on these endings. I'm also indebted to Edgar Rosenberg, who has done a lot of work on this as well in his Norton Critical Edition. Um, here up on the top, what we have is the manuscript with the ending cut out, and then we have the first printed edition with Dickens's marginalia re-editing. So let's look at this. We have a long ending called the, or nicknamed the Piccadilly ending because it takes place in Piccadilly Circus. It was four years more before I saw her myself. I had heard of her as leading a most unhappy life and as being separated from her husband, who had used her with great cruelty and who had become quite renowned as a compound of pride, brutality, and meanness. I had heard of the death of her husband from an accident consequent on ill treating a horse and never being married again to a Shropshire doctor, who, against his interest, had once very manfully interposed on an occasion when he was in professional attendance on Mr. Drummle and had witnessed some outrageous treatment of her. I had heard that the Shropshire doctor was not rich and that they lived on her own personal fortune. I was in England again, in London, and walking along Piccadilly with little Pip, that's Joe and Biddy's child, when a servant came running after me to ask, would I step back to the lady in a carriage who wished to speak to me? It was a little pony carriage, which the lady was driving and the lady and I was sadly upon one another. I am greatly changed, I know, but I thought we would like to shake hands with Estella too, but 
lift up that pretty child and let me kiss it. She supposed the child, I think, to be my child. I was very glad afterwards to have had this interview, for in her face and in her voice and in her touch, she gave me the assurance that suffering had been stronger than Miss Havisham's teaching and had given her a heart to understand what my heart used to be. So here she says very little um, and never descends from the chariot or the carriage. There is no real hint um, that anything has happened or that anything will happen, right? She's going to continue on her way. Pip and Pip are going to continue on their ways. Bulwer Lighton, Dickens' friend, reads this and says, you know what? That's a little too depressing for the period right now. And remember, we have this pattern. Wedding, wedding, we should have a wedding. Bulwer's like, whoa, you're really like setting the people down. So Dickens writes another ending. In 1861, he writes the manuscript ending here. I took her hand in mine, and we went out of the ruined place. And as the morning mists had risen long ago when I first left the forge, so the evening mists were rising now. And in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me, I saw the shadow of no parting from her, but one. So here, taking the hand, going forth, think about Wemmick's wedding, think about Joe's wedding, boom, this is a wedding image, particularly because of this last image, last moment, the shadow of no parting from her, but one, that is, till death do us part. That's when the past. Dickens crosses out a little bit of this when he then creates the um, printed edition of 1862. I saw no shadow of another parting from her. So a very slight difference. Now though, we don't have that explicit reference to the marriage ceremony. And we've also shifted the negation, right? Now it's no shadow of another parting instead of shadow of no parting. So what does that mean? Um, it's hard to say, like the no shadow of another parting means that um, they'll just always maybe be together and we're negating the shadow part. So we're negating the, the darkness aspect that has maybe been there all along. The one thing that stays the same is the death of her husband from an accident consequent on his ill treating treatment of a horse. So a couple small changes, right? We get rid of the parentheses in the status house edition. We change ill-treating to ill-treatment. Um, this implies, though, that, you know, Bentley Drummond is a bad man. He abuses animals, and that's kind of why he gets this comeuppance from a horse. But it is a quite wonderful curiosity that that's the thing that Dickens decided. You know what? I want to keep, I want to keep that horse. What else is different? Slash the same. Well, here I'm trying to offer an example by using red that shows the similarities. And um, blue is slight differences. But the big difference is in the Piccadilly version, she only obliquely speaks. Pip tells us what she has said. She gave me the assurance that suffering had been stronger than Miss Havisham's teaching and had given her a heart to understand what my heart used to be. This changes to Estella talking and says, suffering has been stronger than all other teaching. So we're taking out Miss Havisham's name and it's taught me to understand what your heart used to be. So we're giving um, her a little bit more agency here by giving her the words, even though they are still focused on Pip. What I really like is the kind of slight revelation we're in Pip's head. He puts all the blame on Habesham. When we're in Estella's head, though, it's all other teaching. That is all of the teaching that happens in Victorian society against a young woman like Estella. However, my, I prefer the, the second ending. So I, you know, it's a fun question to ask. Hey, do you prefer the Piccadilly ending, the status house ending? What do you think about the small differences? For me, I like it because of all of the partings. So that's a huge thematic difference. I remember chapter 27, the way it ended. Joe saying, Pip, dear old chap, life is made of ever so many partings welded together. In the Piccadilly ending, we did, the word part doesn't even appear. By 1862, though, we start really building it in. Glad to part again, Estella. To me, parting is a painful thing. To me, the remembrance of our last parting has been ever mournful and painful. She responds, I have been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. Right? We're building, and that's the Bentley reference there too, right? Bentley Drummond. Um, everybody is using this language of the forge and forging. Very curiously, we have friends that I am bending over her right after it was a bend. Really, something 
curious is happening there. Estella, we will continue friends apart. He recalls leaving the forge. And then that line, I saw no shadow of another parting from her, right? The, the, the chain has been constructed. Um, the, the link is now uniting them together. Um, she had made a request of it being friends apart. And he's like, no, we are going to be part. Um, so that's all I have for you. Um, lots of things, obviously, that we were not able to talk about over the course of these episodes, but I hope it's given you some fruitful thought. And I look forward to seeing you for next season, whatever we end up covering. Thank you. And this is where we part.